Welcome everyone uh, to the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers uh, presentation on brief intro to borderline personality disorder for child protection staff. Uh, we're delighted to be joining you today from the traditional land uh, and unceded territory of the Mi'kma'ki. We are all treaty people. Uh, I, uh, today's presentation will be uh, 45 minutes uh, and it's going to aim to inform folks about child and child protection staff, uh, including family support workers, key introductory issues and understanding the diagnosis and traits, as well as provide concrete suggestions for managing clients suffering from personality disorder. Today's webinar is a collaboration between the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers and the Canadian Association of Social Workers. I'm so happy to introduce our core speaker and my friend Jackie Barkley. Jackie is a social worker and therapist with over 40 years experience. She has worked in child welfare on the child protection team of the IWK as a clinical therapist with the Choices Adolescent Treatment Program on the short stay psychiatric unit at the Nova Scotia Hospital and as a mental health crisis worker in the IWK Emergency Department. In the past 10 years, Ms. Barkley has provided counseling to the Department of Community Services, child protection clients, and completed parental capacity capacity assessments, has been registered with family court for the provision of custody access assessments, and has been a therapist for individuals with the Provincial Victim Services Program. Ms. Barkley has also written and presented workshops extensively over many years regarding anger management, white privilege, culturally competent therapeutic intervention, contemporary parenting analysis. She has lectured at Dalhousie University, Acadia University, and Harvard University. Jackie is actively involved in her community and is a, lo a, lo a longtime activist and advocate regarding anti-Black racism, poverty, and anti-colonial issues involved with Indigenous rights in Canada. Just a few housekeeping items for uh, folks who are joining us who may not have been part of uh, the CASW webinar series before is Jackie's going to be presenting for about 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes of questions and answers at the end. Uh, please note that all the details you need on how to access the slide deck and other resources, get your certificate and, and uh, a certificate of attendance and other housekeeping information is found at the bottom of your screen. All the widgets can be accessed by clicking the icons at the bottom of your window. You can also resize and move around the elements you see on your screen to customize your viewing experience. So if you want to see more of the PowerPoint, you can make that bigger. If you want to see more of Jackie, you can also make her window bigger. During the presentation, if you have a question that comes up, please feel free to write it in the question section, which you can also find in your widget app at the bottom of the page. I'll be monitoring at the end uh, and uh, asking those questions directly to Jackie. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie and she's going to walk us through today's presentation. Thank you, Alec. And uh, let me just make, I think, one small correction. My understanding is that I will be uh, delivering the lecture for an hour and uh, 15 minutes, and then we will have 15 minutes for discussion. So someone can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so with regard to the question of land acknowledgement, I just wanted to talk about the import of that. Uh, I think we have to be very cautious that in this particular period in Canadian history, land acknowledgement can become tokenized. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it can become tokenized. And it's very important for people across the country to know right now that the Mi'kmaq people uh, and uh, who are the um, who are the, the people of this territory, which includes large sections of New Brunswick and PEI, are fighting an enormous struggle uh, in the fisheries. Uh, that situation is active, it is painful, it is difficult, it is causing enormous amount of stress for the Indigenous uh, communities that are involved, and they need support from us to indicate our treaty responsibilities. So um, that's the, that's today's land acknowledgement, that the land in Nova Scotia actually includes the sea. The other thing that I want to mention is that Nova Scotia has a very unique history with regard to uh, the history of enslavement um, in the 1700s and 1800s, a huge number uh, people of African descent who had been enslaved in the United States were brought to this province uh, 
uh, living in horrendous conditions and have experienced uh, racism and white supremacy during that entire time while they have been um, a significant and important part of this province's history. So I just wanted to add that. Um, so Alec has already mentioned the objectives and now I just want to give some context. One of the things Alec mentioned is that I've been a social worker for over 40 years which can give you all some indication of the technical challenges of doing this. Um, so I think you've already seen that. All right, so I wanna talk a bit about the social context of social work and psychiatry. And again, the first thing that I wanna mention is that there are no institutions in which social workers conduct our activities that are not marked by uh, colonialism and white supremacy. Um, that does not mean that all the persons are white supremacists, but that we need to understand our role in the institutions in which we are working and the meaning of those institutions to the people who have uh, experienced uh, the child protection issues, experienced uh, the ongoing colonial struggles. So. I want to talk about, specifically in psychiatry, some issues regarding uh, the contemporary context. Um, I think that psychiatry is a developing, um, it's a developing practice, it's a developing context in which we try to understand human behavior. And by that, I don't mean to suggest that I am opposed to psychiatry or its contribution to our work. But I think it's important for us to acknowledge that in the development of psychiatry, the effort to reduce psychiatric diagnosis to concepts such as, well, you know, depression is just like diabetes, for example. That reductionist model of trying to allocate a medical framework to psychiatry um, doesn't help us to understand either its strengths or its weaknesses. And particularly in child protection, because child protection has such a, such a structured legal process, um, often uh, social workers and, uh, and parents and the courts are looking for very precise explanations for the behavior they are seeing. They're actually looking for concepts that will tell them um, the individual's capacity to function as a parent. And while psychiatry has something to offer to that, it is a complicated mix of increasing understandings of biology, increasing understandings of the science of the mind, increasing understandings of research and psychological behavior, but it also remains both politicized and it remains an exercise in art, by which I mean it is, it is, a, it is a place where the ability to understand human behavior cannot simplistically be located in fixed diagnostic frameworks. So um, I think it's important to know that modern psychiatry, particularly since the uh, work on the DSM-5, increasingly understands both the longitudinal and severity indices of how a person experiences mental illness. And what I mean by that is that the various behaviors and experiences that are described through psychiatric diagnoses can be mild, moderate, or severe, uh, and they can be developing over a period of time. And so it isn't like uh, the persons that we work with don't have a diagnosis or they don't have um, 
they don't they don't have symptoms on one day and uh, or sorry they don't have no symptoms on one day and suddenly a fixed and clear diagnosis on the other day so it requires some humility on all our parts to understand what it means when we are attributing psychiatric diagnoses to the people that we work with the other thing I want to comment on briefly before getting specifically to the issue of borderline personality disorder is that behaviors that exist in the diagnosis, symptom behaviors by which we try to understand where people are located on the longitudinal and severity spectrum, those behaviors, given their context, both cultural context, both age context, and both trauma context, behaviors are not simply on some kind of abstract normal bell curve. The behaviors can be uh, adaptive, maladaptive, and normative in very, very different contexts. So I just wanted to be sure that that, um, that indicates, uh, yeah, where we're going here. So the other thing that I want to talk about, again, um, with regard to psychiatric and psychological diagnostic frameworks, is that um, the culture that currently dominates life in Canada is a culture that tends to mystify and and raise the individual experience over the social and collective. And particularly when we're talking about oppressed communities, when we try to take a person outside of their social context, we try to take a woman outside of patriarchy, we try to take an indigenous person anywhere in the country outside of colonialism, we try to take persons of color outside of white supremacy, um, we forget that some of the structures and institutions which have allowed them to cope and survive are often social and collective processes. So when we take the individual out of those processes, often we are unable to genuinely try to understand, uh, try to understand what their experience is. The other thing is that a a minister in the United States uh, was quoted in an article as talking about a concept. Uh, this is Dr. Barber, a minister in the United States, talked about a concept he refers to as DOTSD. And he refers to that as daily ongoing traumatic stress disorder. And we often understand. PTSD, that is post-traumatic stress disorder, as a series of behaviors that come after a particular trauma. But if trauma is ongoing, we have to locate it uh, in the present, um, not as reactions to the past, but as reactions to the present. And I think Dr. Barber's term is enormously helpful in that light. So, um, I'd like to move on to just a basic description of what is called borderline personality disorder. And I've taken this descriptive framework uh, from the website of the of, of CAMH, the uh, CAMH. Let me remember what it stands for again: uh, Center for Addictions and Mental Health in Ontario. And this is the basic, uh, these are the core issues with regard to borderline personality disorder. Number one, intense anger. Let me, yeah, I've forgotten to move my slide. I knew this would be trouble. There we go. Um, intense anger, depression, or anxiety. Feelings of emptiness. Dissociative states unstable identity and self-image, a pattern of impulsive and harmful behaviors, non-suicidal self-injury, 
different from, but connected to suicidality, intense fear of aloneness or being abandoned, and emotional volatility, or what's often referred to as emotional dysregulation. And the last is volatile interpersonal relationships. Um, the volatility can be in intimate relationships or it can be in relationships um, with uh, social workers, for example, or with therapists or with service providers or with an entire range of individuals who might be coming into that person's life. And what often happens uh, is the idealization of one individual. They are perfect. They understand me. They're really good. You're the only one who understands me. You're the only one who gives me support or devaluation. Uh, you don't know anything. You know nothing about me. Um, your uh, involvement with me is wrong. It's inappropriate. It's, it's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this volatile interpersonal relationships also involves idealization and devaluation. And I'm going to come to that later, specifically as it refers to child protection work. So any of you can look up this description of borderline personality disorder. Uh, I will mention several times in this presentation to be very careful of uh, Dr. Google and to be very careful of some of the websites that are created to either value or devalue the diagnosis itself. Uh, just anecdotally, uh, when I worked at the Nova Scotia Hospital on the short stay unit, one of the nurses on that unit, which was designed specifically to provide support to persons with borderline personality disorder, one of the nurses, this is 20 years ago, um, had written out, uh, if you like, a lay person's description of each of those diagnostic frameworks. It was written out in very simple form, and it, it asked questions like, do you feel like this? Is this an experience that you have? And we would take that simple piece of paper and ask questions in, a, in the uh, beginning assessments uh, in the short stay unit and give people an opportunity to answer whether those questions were a part of their experience and then perce their perception of themselves. And rather than being faced afterward with a diagnostic term that would make them frightened, they could then begin to feel that this was a diagnostic term that actually matched their own experience of their own life. And so sometimes, not always, it was a, an enormous relief for people to hear that something that they experience repeatedly is actually called something. And I mention that because I think that sometimes social workers are trained to have so much distrust, distrust of the negative history of psychiatry, um, that we don't appreciate that diagnostic frameworks, while they may be um, they may have to be fluid or more complex, sometimes make people experiencing the symptoms that we talk about very relieved. And I want to come back to that question. So, um, Specifically from a child protection standpoint, before I go to the treatment issues, because so many of the persons involved in child protection systems have themselves been victimized by sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, horrific trauma, uh, domestic violence, uh, an entire range of experiences prior to their coming into contact with the child protection system, it is often not unlikely whether they have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder or not, that they will have some of those descriptive terms or symptoms terms that I described on the previous um, 
slide. In fact, because so many have experienced trauma in their own lives, leading to enormous difficulties in their parenting and in their relationships, um, it's highly unlikely that some of the list of symptoms will not be a part of how they present. And it actually isn't necessary to have a diagnosis in order to see those list of symptoms and know that those are the target behaviors and difficulties that have brought them into contact with the system and that we need to approach with compassion and, and as much knowledge as we can put together. So from a treatment perspective, over many years, uh, what the most proven in evidence-based uh, outcome measurement, most proven treatment has tended to be uh, what is called dialectical behavior therapy, which is a very specific form of cognitive behavior therapy. And dialectical behavior therapy was developed by a psychologist, Dr. Marsha Linehan, um, probably going on 30 years ago now, quite a long time ago. And it is a very specific kind of intervention, which quite specifically in its core, and for those of you who study DBT, please be patient with my narrowing it down to very specific issues. But the core principles of dialectical behavior therapy are, from my understanding, the necessity to both validate and challenge. If we do not validate, validate the trauma experiences that often lead to that diagnosis and to the behaviors within that diagnosis, if we do not validate the suffering, we are unable to, we are unable to begin to demonstrate any kind of understanding of how those behaviors have in fact developed as adaptive, how strange as that sounds. So we can't begin to understand that the behaviors that we see as so uh, debilitating and difficult to manage have in fact arisen from an experience of profound suffering. And it is that suffering that has to be validated. However, we cannot begin to help an individual change behaviors that have become maladaptive in their day-to-day -day life, even if they appeared adaptive in their experiences of trauma. We can't begin to help them understand what is, what is now maladaptive and what is preventing their ability to parent or to form stable relationships in an appropriate way. And note, I'm using the term appropriate, I'm not using the term normal. There are plenty of behaviors in our culture that are considered normal, which from a social and political standpoint are not necessarily adaptive. And remember everyone, today is November 2nd and tomorrow is November 3rd. I won't go any farther than that. So, so, so Marsha Linehan's important contribution to the work with persons suffering from borderline personality disorder is this dialectical behavior therapy, which is formulated on principles of validation and challenge. What is important is that if either one of them are left out and either one of them become neglected in our work with the persons that we're, that we're involved with, then a set of really dysfunctional dynamics with us begin to be added to the list of issues that are already in their life. So for example, um, I think I'll wait on this example. I think I'll wait on this example to the next slide. Um, it's important to know that the actual system that Marshall Linehan developed uh, is very labor intensive. Uh, the training, that some of you watching this may have. I would certainly hope many of you do. I do not have that training. 
uh, I have experience in training of aspects of dialectical behavior therapy, but not the training that is offered uh, at her institute. But it is a very expensive process and it is very manualized. There are very specific aspects that need to be done in a very specific way, which make it enormously difficult um, and expensive to offer in the mental health systems that we have. This is not an argument that we shouldn't have a lot more money in the mental health systems to support people. It's simply an argument that in the current reality, uh, in, and particularly in rural locations and uh, places in Canada without easy access to much more complex treatment interventions, um, it's pretty unlikely that people are going to be, a lot of people are going to have that very specific, very expensive uh, training. Um, and I know that because in my work uh, at, in the mental health institutions that I've worked with locally, um, many of us have tried to use those core concepts, knowing that the access to the training wouldn't of itself be unavailable to us. Child protection workers, not specifically being mental health workers, uh, rarely have access to that training. And so what happens is this incredible compartmentalization where the child protection worker has to deal with all of the frontline issues, the families and the foster uh, parents and the community has to deal with all of these direct issues, but the only people who may have the training are a small number of mental health professionals, sometimes in the public system, sometimes in the private system, but again, uh, not available with the resources that are available to child protection. Again, not that these resources shouldn't be available to child protection, but I'm talking about today and yesterday and tomorrow. Maybe next week, all of this will change. So the training can be expensive and the programs themselves are actually labor intensive because they require collective support for the therapists themselves. Because persons with um, severe indices of borderline personality disorder, uh, their level of need is so high and it is so complex that for the therapist to be able to negotiate the relationship between validation and challenge leaves the therapist themselves in a very difficult situation. And I'm going to get to more of that. So the core message here from my point of view, is that if people can actually obtain this very specific and detailed training, by all means, if communities have the capacity to provide specialized uh, clinics for persons with borderline personality disorder that are well-funded and well-staffed without huge wait lists, that would be terrific. By all means, please fight for it. Um, but that level of resource provision and mental health service provision uh, isn't likely to happen for us tomorrow. So there are enormous controversies related to this diagnosis. Uh, and I want to go through some of it because it has, well, I'll just start going through some of it. So the first one is a history of significant critiques by uh, various uh, feminist authors and persons in feminist movements, uh, a critique of borderline personality disorder because a disproportionate number of women have historically been diagnosed with that disorder. Because some of the behaviors related to that disorder are so difficult, there has been an enormous amount of stigma attached to that disorder. And what that means in practice is that various parts of the community that actually need to come together to support the person with this disorder will often be either denying the existence of the disorder or the patient or the individual in our system themselves with the diagnosis will be denying that they have this disorder because the level of stigma is so profound. 
And that is something the mental health system, those of us who've been in it, have to bear some responsibility for. Sometimes people in hospitals, people in outpatient units, uh, people in private practice will frankly be referred to as oh, that person with that person, that's a, that's a borderline. So the diagnof- diagnosis itself becomes an, an insult about the person suffering that. So any of us who've worked in this system, I think would have a hard time denying that we have heard these things said over and over, oh, that's just a borderline. Oh, she's borderline. Oh, he's borderline. And and what that does is to reinforce the stigma associated with it and therefore reinforce the resistance to considering that the behaviors listed in the diagnostic framework I gave you, that the behaviors are actually a composite of behaviors that whether you call it borderline personality disorder or you call it a different personality disorder or it's called a collection of these behaviors, it is real and it has real presence in the lives of the people we work with. Why is the stigma so high? So with some degree of respect and if you like some even defense of those of us who work in the mental health systems, one of the reasons the stigma is so high is because of the aspect I talked about earlier called splitting, which you will see in the list here. And what that means is that persons whose emotional dysregulation is exceedingly high, those persons will throw their therapist under the bus, or throw their psychiatrist under the bus, or value whoever was the last person who said to them, no, you don't have borderline personality disorder. I don't know why they've called it that. So what happens is, and again, these are adaptive qualities that suffering people have developed through trauma. So if, for example, an individual, man or woman, has been through significant relentless child sexual abuse, for example. They have learned uh, very complex strategies to reject the objectification that they have been through, to mistrust certain people, to grab onto any kind of support and validation that they can get out of desperation, to demonize anyone who's unable to manage the behaviors that are very difficult. So they themselves have learned how to manage a profound degree of pain. But the beginning of therapy can be very painful and difficult because that pain means they will reject, often reject the challenge that they are receiving and only accept the validation that they are receiving, which means it's extremely difficult to move forward. So persons with that diagnosis, with that series of symptoms, have often a very conflicted relationship to their helping persons. And this can be so difficult if there is a if there are a large number of people working with that individual so those of you who work with the child protection system will know that there's often a cast of thousands in the contemporary child protection system so there's the front so first there would be the intake worker then there would be the long-term protection worker then there would be the individual working with the foster family and the children if the children have been taken into care then there would be the foster family Then there would be the person themselves from whom the children have been removed. Then there would be the therapist, perhaps a therapist for the children, perhaps a therapist for the family, perhaps a therapist for the individual. Then there would be the lawyer, sometimes a lawyer for the children, sometimes a lawyer for the parents, sometimes someone who is a um, 
who is a guardian ad litem for the children who've been taken into care. Um, so you could go to a case conference where there are as many as 15 people. And I'm not yet talking about all those really important individuals who do very specific work, such as family support workers, uh, individuals uh, dealing with uh, uh, adolescents in care in group homes. You, you see where I'm going with this. This is a pretty complex cast of thousands. And of course, as our social, as, as our social work training has taught us in our critique of so many of our systems, taught us legitimately, um, there never seem to be enough resources. And so we tend to believe that more is always better. And that's a cautionary tale. More is not always better with persons who have the traits of borderline personality disorder or the diagnosis. Because what it does is to increase the number of people who can be split, increase the number of people who can be validated, and increase the number of people who will be devalued. In separating and compartmentalizing, this is a good person who understands me, and this is a bad person who's critical of me, and this is a bad person, right? So it gets very, very, very difficult. Uh, I'm going to take a moment um, just to have a sip. And to make a sidebar to all of you who are watching this, this is the first time that I've done a webinar, and it is absolutely necessary, but I'm often counting on someone in the audience to remember the term I've forgotten, or someone in the audience to smile when I've lost my place for a moment. So, uh, so I'm just going to assume that you're being a little bit sympathetic out there, and thank you so much. All right, so let me get back to the to the controversies. So this conflicted relationship to therapists and other helping professions, which is called splitting, means that it's extremely important for us to support each other in a circle supporting the person with borderline personality disorder. That doesn't mean we all have to agree with each other. It doesn't mean there won't be people with differing opinions on this, but it means that the if we participate as well as the person with the diagnosis, if we also participate in splitting, if we also demonize the people from the group home who don't understand and validate only the therapists who have more status or demonize the child protection worker or validate the family support worker, if we also participate in letting this happen, it does not serve the interests of the person we're trying to work with. And it does not serve the interests of the family. And it does not serve the interest of the best solution for the child and the family. So it's important that we resist that simplic those simplistic notions. Certainly not to say that in my long career, I have always successfully resisted uh, because I haven't. Um, so then there's the, there's the controversy around the looking for attention concept. And this is really, really important. Uh, when I uh, worked on the short stay unit, I already had worked with persons with borderline dis personality disorder. I worked in youth systems. I worked at the, uh, at the local children's hospital. But I had never heard the term looking for attention used in any other context but to humiliate and reject the suffering of the person who's come to the um, who's come to the emergency room. So a person might come to emergency room with a suicide attempt perhaps, with, with a lot of uh, protective uh, issues, such as they called their best friend after the attempt, they called 911 after the attempt, um, because they were actually desperate for attention. But the attention is to their suffering. 
So we use that term, looking for attention, as if it actually had no meaning. And in my experience, the reason that persons with borderline personality disorder uh, are engaging in self-harming behaviors or suicide, suicidal gestures, it is precisely because they're looking for attention, but not as a petulant child, but as a person with a deep and profound sense of alienation from their own personhood. And so they are desperate for people to understand how profound their pain is, how profound their history of trauma, and how little they were taught strategies, other strategies for managing to take what they need from family, from friends, and from systems. They were never taught how to do that. So often persons without trauma or those of us who've been able to get through life without profoundly dislocating experiences and rejection know that if we need help or we wish to be loved and cared for, we actually can ask for it or we can trust that there are people who will give it to us. But persons with borderline personality disorder do not know that. So the looking for attention statement has an element of accuracy to it, but not in the dismissive and insulting way that we use that term. Mixed and difficult diagnoses. Wow. So any of you who've worked with persons who have emotional dysregulation, um, that is their moods and their behavior and their responses are extreme and intense from very high to very low. Sometimes the diagnosis of uh, bipolar disorder becomes a frequent uh, dual diagnosis or a frequent consideration. Uh, bipolar disorder, in my experience, is different. Um, for those of you who don't work in the mental health system, one of its primary differences is that the experience of the depressive period and the experience of the mania period tend to be not within a day, not 20 times a day, not 20 times a week, but over periods of weeks and months, followed by mania over periods of weeks and months. So it's because of this dysregulation that the, that the diagnosis um, becomes an alternative diagnosis. Um, or a consideration. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder or um, Dr. Barber's term, daily ongoing traumatic stress disorder can include some of the symptoms of borderline personality disorder that I referred to uh, earlier. For example, it is easy to understand this summer uh, around the death of George Floyd and other indigenous people in Canada at the hands of police and black persons in Canada at the hands of police um, and brown persons in Canada at the hands of police. It is easy to understand why there would be a considerable amount of rage in those communities regarding their experience of oppression. So. There's one of the symptoms that has many other experiences related to it. Not knowing who to trust. Not knowing whether the service delivery persons are persons who uh, have any degree of understanding of colonialism or white supremacy. So having to take deep and profound mental health issues to an institution that people have legitimate questions about whether that institution is actually able to uh, provide them with culturally competent service would cause just a bit of distrust, perhaps something that even might look like splitting. So these are very complex questions in the context of other symptoms of borderline behavior, or sorry, symptoms of borderline personality disorder that are related 
to other experiences of su uh, suffering and abuse. The other one is this tricky question of whether someone is sick or their behavior is inappropriate. So sometimes in an emergency room or in private conversation or in an outpatient clinic, people will talk about a person who's really ill, by which we are often referred to persons with um, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual number four, were referred to as in the Axis I disorder. So persons with major mental illness, such as schizophrenia, such as bipolar disorder, uh, and an entire complex range of other illnesses that appear, that appear to have more of a biological characteristic as we've come to understand those. Uh, those illnesses are often more accessible to treatment through medication than the personality disorders. So the personality disorders, uh, while they're called a disorder, um, in fact, on a continuum are really a series of behaviors that have become a disorder when the person's life is out of control and their ability to manage their own life is out of control. So many of the things on the list of symptoms of borderline personality disorders are part of all of our personalities. We've all participated, well, not all, perhaps I, I hope many, many of us have not had to experience self-harm and su suicidal ideation, and not all have been sexually, physically, and emotionally abused or submitted to um, spousal abuse or partner abuse. But we all have had times in which we've devalued some people and valued others unfairly. We've all had times in which we've become, become angry in an inappropriate way. We've all had times in which we have had experiences of deep, deep sadness and, and feelings of, of hopelessness. So, so sometimes those are not medicalized experiences. They are the human experience and we have behaviors as a result of that. But in the case of borderline personality disorder and some of the other personality disorders, the person experiencing those behaviors has reached, if you like, a tipping point, a tipping point at which all of those personality characteristics have now made life very, very difficult to, lead, to live, whether those characteristics belong to the rest of us or not. And so, in sometimes in some of our mental health systems, we will hear references to, oh, so and so, so and so's really sick. And the other emergency room patient is, oh, that's just behavior. Well, it may be just behavior, but it's behavior that's intending to communicate something. Even if it's behavior, the individual needs support to help change. Even if it's now maladaptive in their life, it is still behavior. They do not have the support, experience, lesson, all of the different ways of being able to manage that behavior. So um, the controversy also relates to risk and guilt for the professionals involved, for the families, and many other support persons. And it's because persons with borderline personality disorder have a very high level of completed suicide. So even though uh, certain kinds of suicidal ideation, certain kinds of self-harm, they're not in fact suicidal gestures um, but serious and significant cries for help, though those need to be distinguished from active and completed, or, well, from active suicidal ideation that could result in completed suicide, the attempt to balance the validation and challenge can mean, in many cases, the helpers feeling profound guilt that they themselves were unable to stop a completed suicide or that they 
didn't balance the validation sufficiently with the challenge. As well, persons with borderline personality disorder uh, are not necessarily unintelligent. Persons with borderline personality disorder are often very intelligent, very well educated, very high functioning persons to the outside. And it means that their anger can sometimes be taken out in a terrifying way with professionals. So people in this category will often be the persons who make frequent complaints. Uh, to professional associations, frequent complaints to medical associations, frequent complaints about lawyers. That does not mean persons with borderline personality disorder never or don't have the right to complain or are never wrong uh, or are never right in what they're complaining about. But it means that because some of that highly defended behavior can be very intense very impulsive, very angry, that it leaves the helper people uh, vulnerable to a devaluation that can actually extend to their ability to do their job and to do their work. So there's often a fear uh, of, that people have in working with a person with that diagnosis. I think I've mentioned before at other points in, in this presentation that while there is no specific scientific understanding of what causes borderline personality disorder, why in some situations those traits will develop into a full-blown disorder, and sometimes they will not, um, there is much knowledge related to the fact that a history of trauma, often a history of severe sexual abuse, um, especially by trusted individuals, um, people with uh, very severe attachment issues, and people who have experienced domestic violence, or in their attempt to receive validation, will often get into relationships in which they are unready for the degree of patriarchal assault to which they will be subjected. So by this, I'm not suggesting that persons with borderline dis personality disorder are the authors of their own suffering. I'm simply suggesting that some of that list of issues that I referred to in the desperate need to feel loved or validated can lead them to have greater difficulty in leaving violent relationships or have a greater likelihood of returning to violent relationships or having left one violent relationship um, find themselves in another. This is not to defend patriarchal violence against women. It is simply to say that, that the circle of suffering that creates the behaviors that I'm talking about that can lead to borderline personality disorder make a person even more vulnerable more vulnerable themselves, not choosing to be abused, but more vulnerable to the access to abuse, if you like, or to being targeted and, and singled out. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I am certainly not disagreeing with my, uh, with my colleagues in the women's movement or in the shelter movement that suggest in any way that the women are to blame for their suffering. That, that the, the difficulty in being able to get away is, uh, is sometimes greater. So what are the child welfare, the specific child welfare challenges? I think some of them at this point uh, are probably obvious. Um, I don't think anybody we work with I certainly haven't, I've been doing this a long time. I haven't found anybody yet who I think got up one morning and said, I think I want to be a bad parent. I think I want to, I think I want to drink to oblivion. Well, maybe they thought that, but I've never met anybody who actually wanted that as the only solution. 
So if we can operate under the assumption, independent of the colonial and white supremacy issues of the structures we work in, if we can assume that people, if their behaviors are dangerous to their children, we can assume that that is just not something somebody woke up and decided to do. Um, and so I think our goal has to be to help people become good enough parents. Um, those of you who've been around the child protection system for a long time are probably familiar with the work of Dr. Paul Steinhauer, uh, an esteemed psychiatrist from Toronto, uh, who I had the honor to meet during the 1980s, who was someone uh, in the psychiatric field who had a very profound interest specifically in families and children who wound up in the child protection system. And I think going back and reading some of his material uh, would be helpful for any child protection workers. He was also just a very kind and patient, patient individual. Anyway, uh, I don't know if he was the first one to coin the term good enough parent, but he was certainly the first person I heard use that. So I think that has to be our goal. Um, so the first thing is history, history, history. And often child protection workers are not given time in a case to go back through this individual's history. They're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have access to historic court documents. They don't have access to the documentation perhaps of that individual's own child protection history. They don't have access to all of the very, uh, pre, to the complex pre-existing material, which might help and guide them toward how to, how to help this individual. So, while child protection workers are not necessarily mental health workers as well, I think it's extremely important for child protection teams to be given the opportunity to research the documentation that exists in their own agencies and to actually do complex assessments. Um, so how much history is needed? Well, the history of the parents' trauma and their oppression, the behaviors observed in the parents and very specifically uh, um, detailed, and the behaviors observed in the children. So it's really important to do an inventory of anything that's available to help tell us something about that person. I'm conscious in my own province in Nova Scotia that sometimes child welfare workers who might be working with someone with an intermittent 10 year history of child welfare involvement actually doesn't have time to easily go back and research the specific history of previous child welfare involvements. Uh, lawyers on either side often don't have that opportunity either. And then there's the question of the, the misuse of child protection staff's knowledge that they have themselves and their own experience. And so often I know as a mental health worker that I will be called upon to do the kind of research that a child protection worker with some good training can do just as well as I can. They can ask the same questions. They can go through the same history. They can actually find out the answers to questions that you don't need a specific mental health history to get. Um, you don't have to have, you don't have to have Marshall Anaheim's training and you don't have to have uh, psychiatric training uh, in order to ask really good questions about what a person's life experiences have been in detail. So I think that that's a very important thing that we really need to give people time to do. Um, lacking, lacking support for the skills of child protection workers themselves mean that often there will be a request for 
psychiatric or, or detailed psychological assessments that actually may not be helpful and could be very expensive. I can, if, if people were in the room right now, I would see all kinds of people probably getting uncomfortable. Uh, what I'm simply trying to say is that what's important to remember is that while the diagnosis may help guide the intervention, uh, interventions can actually happen if they are targeted at problem behaviors, because often what the diagnostic conclusions will be after a detailed assessment is, um, the person needs cognitive behavioral therapy counseling uh, in depth over a long period of time. But, well, often child protection workers themselves know that at the beginning of their handling of the case. I'm not saying that uh, psychiatric or psychological assessments are never useful. Uh, I don't think that's true at all. But I think they are sometimes used as a substitute for valuing the knowledge or experience of child protection workers or valuing the knowledge and experience that senior child protection workers uh, or supervisors can support their younger colleagues uh, or less experienced colleagues in developing. Um, I'm going to stop here because this is the moment, I'm not gonna stop, but this is the moment where I believe that uh, Alex Stratford, who's helping me out in this process, thought I would be finished. But I believe the presentation is an hour and a half, so I'm going to be going another 15 minutes and then leaving 15 minutes for a Q&A. So if something terrible has just happened and I don't know that, could someone uh, let me know? All right. Um, You're all good. The other it's all good? Go ahead. All right. So uh, one of the difficulties with uh, borderline personality disorder diagnoses or a significant number of traits is that borderline personality disorder is not amenable to short-term treatment. So while many of us uh, effectively use brief therapy and a whole range of other kind of therapeutic interventions and child protection workers, at least in our province, will secure a therapist to work for maybe three months or six months or nine months. The reality is that uh, work to assist individuals with borderline personality disorder often has to be um, much longer term than three month and six month uh, timelines. So that's just a difficulty. Um, that's a difficulty that child protection work faces because child protection work has uh, has very specific timelines, very specific court timelines, and often at the point at which hopefully children are returned to parents with that diagnosis or adolescents with that diagnosis uh, are able to move forward with some of their life issues while they're in the child protection system, once the case is closed, their accessibility to ongoing treatment or their accessibility with an individual or a treatment or a, a treatment team that they've been working with is now unavailable to them. So that, that timeline issue is a problem. The other thing is that there's a need for experienced therapists to welcome work in the child protection system who have some experience with uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and some experience or training with dialectical behavior therapy. And often the therapists who are available to child protection workers uh, for a whole variety of reasons are not on the lists that are available for child protection workers to solicit help from. Um, and again, there are a variety of reasons here. This is not the place for me to go into them, but it is difficult. The other thing is that uh, Individuals with that diagnosis or number of those issues are best uh, served through some kind of collaborative team. Um, and often it should include group and individual work. I know in our province that uh, the individual therapists who are available to work from a through a client referral uh, for child protection clients, um, 
have no group practice. Uh, they operate individually, uh, can't bill for groups, can't actually run DBT groups. That has to be done, at least in our province, in the public uh, mental health system. And these collaborative teams are important for providing support to the therapists themselves. And this doesn't mean, this, I'm not trying to add another layer of stigma to persons with borderline personality disorder, like, oh, well, you know, they're more expensive and they're more difficult and they're more this and they're more that. I'm simply trying to say that, um, that they, they themselves are best served and the individuals working with them are best served through a team process that allows the therapists themselves to ask for help. Right? Did I push this too far? Did I not push that far enough? Again, that constant ba balance between validating and uh, challenging. So the therapists themselves often need that support or the therapist may have been challenged by, uh, by the uh, patient or the client um, with threats. Uh, you're a terrible therapist and, 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 I, and I will get your license. Again, uh, it's important for the therapist not to abandon the individual at that very point, but they will need some support systems for them to access uh, evaluation and, and, and reframing, if you like, the direction of the work that they might be doing with a person with that diagnosis. It's a very, very difficult situation. The other issue that I don't have here on this slide is the question of confidentiality. Um, because I started work with uh, children uh, who had been abused by families, uh, their own families and other adults in their lives in the 80s, I'm extremely conscious of how important confidentiality was so that children would feel able to go to an adult, another adult, a safe adult, apart from the person who was abusing them, who would not, who would consider uh, the, the charge, who would consider uh, the allegation uh, without endangering the child. So I remember in the 80s how confidentiality was actually often a new concept. Uh, it was a new idea that you as the uh, investigating social worker or the a mental health worker would not automatically tell their parents what was happening. And I value those concepts of confidentiality. Confidentiality are also an enormous issue uh, for persons who are victims of domestic assault, for example. These are huge, important areas of confidentiality. However, I've been around long enough to see when confidentiality becomes a barrier to a circle of support. It becomes a barrier to a team of people being able to collaborate in supporting the individual's needs who has that diagnosis or the adolescent with that diagnosis or with those traits. So it's a very important fine line there when confidentiality is supportive of the legal and, and and, and risk issues that the client is experiencing and when confidentiality becomes a barrier to effective mental health intervention. The very complicated question. Confidentiality is also rooted in uh, European individualism. And again, while not all concepts of individualism are bad by any means, uh, confidentiality can be seen uh, in uh, in indigenous communities, it sometimes it can be seen in uh, communities of African descent, can be seen in communities of uh, different um, other than European descent. Uh, confidentiality can be seen as preposterous because in those communities, the idea of family and the idea of circle of support uh, is extremely important. So um, some helpful and more effective ways of responding in a non-clinical environment. All right, 
Um, number one, validate and challenge. I think I've already made that really clear. Whether you're a mental health therapist or a child protection worker, uh, it is helpful to validate the person's experience and to challenge their behavior. Leaning too hard on one side or the other can really damage uh, the relationship to the individual. Get support from your team or supervisor. That's one of the intrinsic issues uh, in uh, dialectical behavior therapy, but there's no reason why we can't support each other in our various systems in helping individuals with those issues. Uh, supervisors helping the, uh, the child protection workers deal with the risk and the fear of complaints. Um, it's really important because it's a line that has to be walked, which validates the possibility that the child protection worker or the therapist have actually done something inappropriate. And at the same time, uh, understand that sometimes the risk issues are related to a protective anger focus with uh, of the of the client themselves. Very calm respect for the rights of the individual we're working with, um, and that is really important to distinguish from agreement. When people are stating their anger and their frustration, particularly with the child protection system, it is important for us, whether we agree with the behaviors that brought them into that case, that situation or not, it is important for us to validate their rights. So I think, uh, I think you're not a good child protection worker and I don't think you're, you're doing your job appropriately. Um, uh, someone responding with, I can understand why you might feel that way. Here's the phone number of my supervisor. I can understand why you feel that way. Here's the telephone number for the College of Social Workers. Uh, in other words, we have to act without fear to defend the rights of people who might use those rights in a way that might harm us or that might be unfair while remaining open to the fact that we might have, uh, we might have made a bad decision or, or a bad intervention. Avoiding defensiveness. Uh, people with borderline personality disorder often when they are angry they will attack in a way that leaves uh, the person with best intentions ready to put up the wall ready to say that's not true and it's important to avoid that defensiveness to ask questions about the criticism and to not be afraid to say to answers uh, I don't know the answer to that I don't understand that. That's not my area of expertise. So it's important not to react to threats and escalation, which may happen. And it's also important if you were wrong, to be able to apologize sincerely, not sentimentally. And I refer to that, sorry, on the next page here, I'm referring to that as radical authenticity. The radical authenticity is very different from sentimentality. So often in social work, we will say things like, oh, I understand, or I know what you mean, or I can feel what you're saying. And radical authenticity is a way of saying, no, actually, I don't know how you feel. No, I don't understand what's happening, but I will do my best to support you if you do your best to explain to me what you want me to understand. So it's a, it's a way of, rather than, than, than cliched, sentimental responses, being very authentic. Understanding and working to minimize splitting, being sure that there's a circle of communication. Again, within confidentiality, the persons I work with, I always ask to actually sign uh, extensive releases of information or releases for me to speak with their lawyer, their child protection worker, their family support worker, so that we can work together. And, um, and I think that that's very, very important. And it really is what I'm emphasizing here in the next couple of statements. Uh, being very transparent and truth telling consistently. So sometimes uh, less experienced child protection workers or family support workers or therapists uh, might say, why well, I, I don't want to give the whole truth because it will upset them, it will not be appropriate. And it is better to upset people with the truth than lie to people who are already fearing they will be lied to. Uh, 
uh, avoid mixed messages and inappropriate alliances with regard to splitting. And that's why in my experience, case conferences and, and situations for the client to be present in collective discussion of the issues they're struggling with. I'm hurrying a bit here, noticing the time. Um, it is, I've already said it's important to have detailed social histories regarding trauma, intersectionality, experiences of oppression, uh, racial, sexual um, oppression with regard to, uh, to people who are transgendered, uh, dealing with issues of homophobia. Um, it's important to be transparent regarding the limitations of confidentiality. So the minute someone begins with, I'm going to tell you something that's really important that I've never told anybody, promise you won't tell my child protection worker, I immediately say, I don't know if I need to tell your child protection worker, so don't tell me. If you trust me sufficiently and you trust how I will use that information, by all means. Clear role definitions. And finally, I've got this little note that says our social work training can be an actual barrier to efficacy. And by that, I mean sometimes nice just really isn't what somebody needs. What they need is compassion, which is different from sentimentality and niceness. So uh, I'm sure lots of people will want to comment on that, <laughs> or maybe you won't. Uh, resources, uh, beware of Dr. Google, you and your clients. I find that the website uh, at CAMH in Ontario Centre for Addictions and Mental Health Ontario is an excellent website. I find the Canadian Mental Health Association, in particular the British Columbia website under mental illnesses has a lot of good resources for persons with borderline personality disorder. And finally, a book I never saw till last year, and I saw it at the social work department at the Dartmouth General called Stop Walking on Eggshells, which is a, a, a layperson's guide for families and individuals dealing with persons with borderline personality disorder. I think it's excellent. It doesn't talk down to people, but it is done in a very accessible manner. So thank you all for your patience, uh, questions, and above all, in my note, remembering that Persons with borderline personality disorder are persons with an enormous amount of suffering. So, questions? Hey, Jackie. You got some really glowing reviews throughout that, so you should feel very proud. Oh, uh, I've got some <laughs> questions here Okay. from some folks. I'm going to start with this one because it was interlayered uh, with a couple other questions, too. But do you have okay. suggestions on how to engage in and educate professionals that describe individuals, uh, that help describe individuals with uh, BDT as behavioral. Uh, this person often runs into this issue uh, in terms of trying to communicate what you've just communicated with us. What are some tricks and some tools you might have utilized in, in your practice to help with that? Um, I have trouble with that one too. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, often uh, the individuals will be people who don't particularly want to hear criticism. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess I would quote, uh, what's his name, uh, the country singer who wrote, no one to hold him, no one to fold him, no one to walk away, no one to run. Um, I think... Kenny Rogers. Uh, Kenny Rogers. I found that song very useful to remember. And the suggestions that I would make is uh, rather than coming out with a huge criticism, but indicating, you know, Dr. So-and-so or Joanne so-and-so or Harry so-and-so, uh, the symptoms of borderline personality disorder are behaviors. Uh, they're also symptoms. And when we look at persons who are in the Axis I uh, categories with severe uh, mental illnesses, that's all we've got is examination of their thought processes and how they act, which is what behavior is. So I would just kind of bring them around very gently to, well, it might be behavior, but it doesn't mean it doesn't reflect suffering at a significant diagnosis. So just an extension of that, Jackie. Um, 
Um, You're. I'm I'm cutting in and out. We're having some technical difficulties. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, I'm back now. You're back. Yep. All right. So the question comes from uh, just an extension of that first one, but particularly uh, judges and lawyers who uh, don't perhaps operate in the same sphere of mental health um, or social services that social workers do. Uh, is there specific uh, education or knowledge that might help them in their understanding, particularly uh, when uh, helping judges uh, where we can, um, who unknowingly engage in splitting? Hmm. Well, that's a really interesting question. And probably the only answer that I could give is a is is to remember that when you are testifying in court, there's absolute you know, I social workers aren't used to doing that. It makes many of us uncomfortable. But when you're testifying in court, can you hear me all right there? I, I'm hearing some uh, doubling up. But, but I'll just keep on going. So when social workers are testifying in court, it is absolutely possible to just say to whichever lawyer is asking you the 47th question and trying to tie you down uh, as if psychiatric diagnoses, diagnoses were uh, like diabetes, they just need a little blood test. Uh, it's just to say, excuse me, and turn to the judge and say, um, your Honor, may I just take a few moments to talk about my experience with uh, psychiatry? And I did that one time, a moment I'm really proud of. I turned around to the judge and I said that, and I then spoke for 40 minutes <laughs> directly to the judge about the nuance and complexity uh, and the ideas that I mentioned in one of the first slides about psychiatry, that no matter how much psychiatry tries to present itself as precise and scientific and like medicine, uh, I think psychiatry needs to be proud of the fact that the part of us that they are dealing with is the mind. And it's not like repairing a broken leg. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean repairing a broken leg isn't important, but psychiatry is historical, it is evolving, it is cultural, it is complex uh, and it's art. And there's absolutely nothing the matter with turning to a judge in the middle of a session, at which point you also have educated all the lawyers in the room uh, and say, uh, here's what I understand about this issue. And here's why I think uh, my other learned colleagues are getting so frustrated with me. Thanks, Jackie. I, uh, nice again, I, <laughs> you have the opportunity, uh, um, you know, when you are giving your testimony, as you said, to do that education. It is literally a pulpit yep. sometimes. Yep. Um, yep. So just a couple more because we are running close to time. Um, there's a question mm -hmm. here about uh, short term interventions that can, may be able to be used while perhaps somebody is waiting uh, for uh, the specific DBT um, uh, treatments that, that may be offered, particularly in the context mm -hmm. of trying to preserve children's placements um, while the case planning is being cre uh, created and implementing. So is there aspects that, again, could be done in the short term while a more long term plan is being created? Okay, so, so what I have tended to do, and I'm sure there are many people who, who wouldn't feel comfortable with this, but what I have attempted to do in the early stages of working with someone with these indicators in a child protection setting is to hold the first clinical meeting with the child protection worker there. Um, I'm sure there are some lawyers who would be upset about it, but in the in the introductory meeting, what I always explain to the person involved in the child protection system, the reason I'm asking your child protection worker to be here is because I suspect your child protection child protection worker has some issues that you do not agree with. Mm. Is is uh, perhaps taking your children into care or putting a plan in place, but you do not agree with the reasons. Um, I am part of putting a plan into place and my role is to understand the child protection issues 
and understand your point of view on the child protection issues, but I am not a judge. And so until you get perhaps the more complex treatment that you need, I am going to validate the suffering that you've been through, and I'm going to challenge you on the behaviors that have brought us to this meeting today. And I'm not expecting you to like that, not right now, but this is all I have to offer. And no, you do not have to trust me. You don't have to trust me until you think I'm doing something that is helpful and useful to your situation. Thanks for that. I wanted to ask one more question, and then I think we'll uh, we'll wrap wrap it up for today. But uh, there's a question okay. again about um, outside of uh, again good information to speak to. Can you speak about the need for case management support in addition to therapy for individuals whose lives are not stable or even street involved? Um, there are very few options for case management. Uh, it seems for those who might be outside of the child welfare system for the longer term. And do you know any of examples that might be happening? Uh, particularly in Nova Scotia, where we can see that? Well, um, I think there are some case management programs in Nova Scotia, particularly with people whose lives are in chaos. Um, I think that some of those systems, those, those processes, in my view, may not be providing enough training to the staff to support them in knowing um, when the demands are being made in a way that's helpful to the client needs and the demands are being made in a way that isn't good for the for the client's long-term needs so I think case managers and people doing case management programs and systems need far more training than you know, calling to find out where there's a hotel or we're calling to find out where there's a shelter spot or calling to find out they need a lot more training. And I believe that their work will be better when they are in, with the persons they're working with, where they are empowering them um, to whatever level is possible. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, and for everyone who engaged today, a big thank you to you as well. Uh, just some more housekeeping is that you will be able to access this webinar again uh, by using the same link that you registered with today. And um, there'll also be a certificate of uh, of attendance that you'll be able to download through that link as well. Uh, we'll also be posting this video, or our partners at the CASW will be posting this YouTube, uh, this video as a YouTube, uh, which then you can share and uh, use it to help uh, educate and engage your peers uh, in this topic as well. So a big thank you to all, a big thank you to Jackie, and we'll see you again very soon. All right, goodbye everyone. Stay safe.